Welcome everyone to Understanding the Basics of the Farm Credit System. My name is Audrey Thompson. I'm a staff attorney here with the Penn State Center for Agricultural and Shale Law. If, uh, the center provides legal and academic research for ag legal stakeholders and rural communities, and we provide much of our content through our website at aglaw.psu.edu. Here we publish our agricultural and shale law weekly reviews, which cover recent ag and energy legal developments and include a full listing of relevant state and national legislation and executive branch publications. We also host several resource compilations under our research by topic. We have our virtual resource rooms, which provide a compilation of various resources, including statutes, regulations, case law, relevant related articles on a singular topic on ag or energy law. We also have our issue trackers that are similar to a virtual resource room, but these present a single issue that is evolving in a timeline format, and you can see that issue developing through statutes, regulation, and case law. We also have audio and video content under our Watch or Listen tab with our Ag Law podcast and the Farmland Energy podcast. These are all available on the major app pod podcast platforms. And we also have our YouTube channel, which is where we'll post a recording of this webinar. Under the events page, you can see uh, the, the PowerPoints and other materials for this presentation here, Understanding the Basics of Farm Credit. Uh, we'll post, we've posted the materials right here where you can access them. So don't miss out on all this great content. Please subscribe for our updates and uh, to get on our mailing list and uh, stay in con contact with us. And one last plug for the center here. We also operate the Pennsylvania Agricultural Mediation Program, which is funded through USDA. This program has historically facilitated mediations between ag producers and the USDA, but its authorization has been expanded over the last several years, and we are now able to mediate a broader range of issues between different parties. Please feel free to contact Jackie Schweikler, our program coordinator, with any questions about ag mediation. Today's webinar on farm credit is part of the Center's Understanding Agricultural Law Series, a course designed to provide subject matter literacy and competence on fundamental issues of agricultural law to attorneys and business advisors who work with or represent agricultural or rural clients, but who may not uh, specialize in agricultural law. This series is wholly sponsored by the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture's Ag Business Center, uh, uh, Ag Business Development Center, which was established through the 2019 Pennsylvania Farm Bill. The Agricultural Business Development Center aims to enhance the long-term vitality of Pennsylvania farms by supporting farm transitions, both from generation to generation and conventional to organic, supporting beginning farmers, providing risk management education, and providing financial assistance through low interest loans and grants. This webinar is the 15th webinar in the Understanding Agricultural Law series, and as you can see, we've covered numerous topics so far, including ag labor, land use regulation, conservation programs, crop insurance, ag finance, Pennsylvania's Clean and Green, and many others. Recordings of all of these webinars are available on our YouTube site, and accompanying materials can be found under our Understanding Agricultural Law landing page. Upcoming topics in our Understanding the Basics of Ag Law series include Understanding the Basics of USDA Commodity Programs, Milk Pricing, and Pesticides. Free CLE credit will be available for all of those. And finally, just a few reminders before we get started here, this webinar is being recorded. If you have any questions, please write them in the Q&A feature, and I will collect those and ask uh, our presenter here at the end. And please do ask questions. We want to have a dialogue as much as possible in this webinar format. Also, there will be a few survey questions that pop up throughout the webinar. We really encourage you to fill those out and give us some feedback. We want to tailor our programming to your interests and needs, so let us know what you like, what we can change, and what you'd like to see in the future. And we will take that into consideration as we continue to plan this series. And if you have signed up for the free CLE credits, there will be a link posted in the chat. Um, I think Jack Schweckler may be posting that pretty soon here. And you will need to fill out that form to get your credits. And as part of our responsibility to ensure attendance with the CLE, I will provide a code word about halfway through, and you'll be prompted to enter that code word into your CLE form um, about halfway through the program. So, all right, I will turn this webinar now over to uh, Doug Durkin who is the Association Council with Horizon Farm Credit. Doug, the screen is yours. Um, as Audrey introduced me, my name is uh, Douglas Durkin. I'm Association Council for Horizon Farm Credit. Horizon 
um, is an association within assigned territory in the mid-Atlantic states for uh, portions of five states, including the entirety of Pennsylvania. I'm also one of about 101 attorneys within the farm credit system, and plus a few uh, outside attorneys that regularly uh, represent the uh, farm credit system. Um, and as to our name, the farm credit system, uh, that's actually comes straight out of um, uh, the United States Code at um, 12 USD section uh, 2002. So uh, I want to thank all the uh, attorneys participating in this um, uh, webinar. Um, and I want to encourage you to continue uh, gaining uh, specialization, as Audrey mentioned, and expertise in um, agricultural law and in the areas of law in which farmers um, need legal assistance. There is nationwide a need for more attorneys um, with that specialization in agricultural law, and it also presents an opportunity um, uh, for attorneys in rural America to gain expertise and specialization. So I would encourage you to continue in these uh, Penn State Law School Center for uh, Ag and Field Law programs, as well as uh, uh, the um, uh, other agricultural law associations, uh, such as the uh, National Center for Agricultural Law and the American Agricultural Law Association. Um, so with that, the disclaimers, uh, uh, the uh, comments I make here today are on my own. They are not attributable to my employer nor to the farm credit system. And the information I provide here is for informational purposes only. It's not to be construed as the giving of legal advice. Okay, I'm going to give this presentation in two separate parts. The first part will concentrate on the history of the farm credit system. So why is that important? The reason it's important is whenever you're dealing with any financial institution created by Congress, uh, you'll see over history that as there is an economic crisis or a war, Congress tends to start with the law that they had and then pass another law to deal with that economic crisis or the uh, consequences of war. Um, but those laws don't often mesh. They don't, the second law doesn't necessarily amend the first law and then they'll keep doing this. So you wind up with like a layer cake with um, uh, a series of different laws regarding the same entity. And that is why when you deal with Horizon, uh, with when you deal with Horizon Farm Credit, you're actually dealing with C three separate entities with three separate charters. That's not because we create subsidiaries like banks do. We're not permitted to do that, but it's because of the layers of law uh, passed by Congress. Um, and it's also important to know because uh, as lawyers, when you go to read the case law relevant to us, you're going to see terms that are no longer in use today. And you'll see the cases that have been negated because of subsequent legislation. So that's uh, important to keep in mind. So um, with that, let's move on to part one slide, uh, the farm credit system. Um, the farm credit system is currently controlled by the Farm Credit Act of 1971. It is a network of borrower owned lending institutions and related service organizations serving all 50 states and Puerto Rico. It provides credit and related services for farmers, ranchers, um, and aquatic producers and harvesters. It includes system banks, originally 12, now four. And even though I use the word banks, they're not banks in the sense that um, you traditionally uh, think of, and I'll explain their, their role uh, uh, in a later slide. And it's also composed of associations, each of which is governed by their own board of directors. And the stockholders of these uh, banks and associations are the farmer borrowers. That's critical to know because it's a cooperative um, type organization. And the reason stockholders are important to you, as we'll see in some of the later slides is, um, that the stockholders receive a financial benefit at the 
uh, end of the year based on the profits that the individual association uh, produces. What it's like a dividend, and although we're authorized to pay dividends, what uh, are is typically being paid today is something known as patronage. So that's, and frankly, that's why uh, farmers uh, love doing business with us because it, it's an, uh, effectively a rebate on their uh, interest that they pay throughout the year. Um, in uh, in our scenario, that's typically paid around March of every year. Okay. Um, congressional purpose, uh, giving you the uh, statute uh, and the wording uh, provided by Congress. But the bottom line here is, um, and what you uh, what you need to know is that for any nation to be successful, um, certain things are required, and that's you know rule of law, a national defense, but more importantly. Um, you have to be able to feed the people. And that's, excuse me, that is why um, Congress, state legislatures have such an interest in agriculture and uh, pass so many laws um, to um, support agriculture to make the nation successful and fatten the people fed. Okay, um, moving on. I next we have a video. Audrey, if you would please run it. For a century, Farm Credit has been supporting rural communities and agriculture with reliable, consistent credit and financial services. But do you know why Farm Credit was created? Rural enterprises and agriculture are essential, yet volatile. Farm Credit was created to help rural communities from coast to coast weather financial ups and downs. Our access to financial resources and cooperative structure have allowed us to remain strong through bad and good times. Thanks. Farm Credit supports the diverse financial needs of farmers, ranchers, and rural businesses. We also help rural communities thrive by financing vital infrastructure and communication services. That steady flow of credit means more jobs, more economic growth, and more investment in rural America. Today's beginning farmers are the backbone of tomorrow's rural communities. That's why Farm Credit actively supports youth leadership programs like 4-H and the FFA and makes an average of 60,000 loans to beginning farmers each year. As a network of cooperatives, each locally owned by our borrowers, Farm Credit profits are returned directly to our customers, which helps strengthen the rural economy. Our mission has always been to support rural communities and agriculture, making America strong today and tomorrow. Visit farmcredit.com to learn more. Thank you, I hope you enjoyed that little bird video. Um, the next slide, I wanna point out that first, uh, every component of the farm credit system is a government sponsored enterprise. We are also each an instrumentality of the United States of America. And we are subject to the Government Corporation Control Act at 31 U.S.C. 9101 at SEC. Now, the Government Corporation Control Act, the main uh, impact of that is we are not allowed to create subsidiary corporations as banks can do. Um, next slide. Um, instrumentality uh, does, oh, I'm sorry, the government sponsored enterprise. I've given you the statute here that with the full definition as to what uh, constitutes the government sponsored enterprise. Um, next is the instrumentality. I've given you the two references to the federal laws where Congress has identified uh, the components of the farm credit system as instrumentalities of the United States of America. Their authority to do business is granted by uh, Congress via the Farm Credit Administration. Um, and we are actually issued three charters, as I mentioned earlier, authorizing us to do business in specific counties. And in Horizon's case, it's the portions of five states, but the entirety of Pennsylvania and the in entirety of Delaware. And because we are a government-sponsored enterprise uh, created in this Farm Credit Act, our activities are controlled by federal law and um, any state laws 
uh, to the contrary, will uh, be preempted via the doctrine of federal preemption arising under the supremacy clause of the uh, United States Constitution. I've given you the citation of several cases um, uh, relevant to that point. Um, necessity and need. Um, the point here is that over history, over centuries, there's been a need to finance agriculture and it's been addressed in different ways uh, in the United States going back to 1732 and then with the Homestead Act of 1862. But the origins of our current system um, began with, um, so if we move on to uh, slide 19, um, to the uh, origins of the farm credit system uh, started with uh, President Theodore Roosevelt uh, creating a commission to uh, that led to the creation of farm credit system, which started in 1916, uh, next slide, by uh, President uh, uh, Wilson when he executed the Federal Farm Loan Act, um, which created federal land banks and uh, National Farm Loan Associations. And as I uh, mentioned earlier, these are terms that are not used today because Congress passed uh, uh, subsequent laws changing the title. So in 1916, if you wanted to join the brand new farm credit system, you would have to gather together 10 farmers to uh, borrow a total of at least $20,000. You would apply to a federal land bank of which there were 12 at that time uh, for a charter as a National Farm Loan Association. You had to borrow minimal, minimum amounts for your farm mortgage and you have to buy stock. Uh, purchase of stock remains a, a continuing requirement today. Okay. These next several slides, I'm going to um, uh, condense them in my verbal presentation um, so we can save room for the um, other, perhaps more significant material at the end. So essentially, this uh, the next few slides present the uh, story that I, I, I introduced at the beginning, where you have an economic crisis, you have a war, um, and, and that results in Congress having to take action to um, uh, address the situation that is created as a result of that. So we have World War I, and after World War I, prices collapsed in the agricultural sector, and there was a need at that point in time to mechanize agricultural for the first time. So there was a need to finance this uh, equipment. And so Congress uh, passed uh, another act uh, that created production credit associations, the PCAs, which still exists today. And Horizon, uh, one of our charters is for Horizon Farm Credit PCA. Um, the focus of those is uh, uh, short and intermediate term loans. Okay, then we hit the depression of um, the Great Depression in 1933 with Farmers being in financial crisis, and uh, as a result, the uh, farm credit system being in a financial crisis, Congress had to uh, uh, pass a law to uh, bail out uh, the farm credit system. Um, that was the Farm Credit Act of 1933. Um, so a rescue was made by Congress. So then we get through World War II, and we hit the 1950s, and once again, there's prosperity. In America, there's prosperity in agriculture, and that sees results in a great consolidation of these various small associations throughout the United States. They began to consolidate. Um, and by 1968, that prosperity in agriculture had resulted in paying off all the government funds that had been used uh, from 1933 onward to rescue the, the system. And uh, the system was once again. Um, uh, free of any uh, government funding. So um, I'm going to skip ahead then to um, okay. Recent history. So 1971, Congress passed the current act under which we are operating uh, today, the Farm Credit Act of 1971. 
And what it did was greatly expand the lending authority of the farm credit system by adding the authority to uh, make rural home loans, to finance related, farm related, agricultural related services, finance leasing, and to finance international agricultural trade. And also authorize the financing of rural utilities. So I'm now up to uh, slide 28. Um, trouble in the 1980s. Um, in the 1980s was from 1981, 1989 was the last time there was a substantial uh, economic crisis in the American agricultural uh, uh, sector of the economy. And if uh, you're an attorney of my age, you would uh, probably remember that from um, uh, Willie Nelson's and uh, John Mellencamp's uh, uh, Farm Aid concerts. Um, so in 1985, the farm credit system lost $2.7 billion. It was the largest one-year loss for any financial institution in U.S. history. So, of course, Congress has to react to that, and they did with the Farm Credit Act of uh, 1985. And so that resulted in um, making the Farm Credit Administration a true arm's length prudential regulator, much like um, the Office of the Control of the Currency is today for uh, banks and as the Office of Thrift Supervision once was for the savings and loans. Um, it also provided for a full-time presidentially appointed three-member board of directors that uh, um, operate the uh, uh, Farm Credit Administration. And the Farm Credit Administration was restructured to, to give it oversight, regulatory, and enforcement powers uh, for purposes of avoiding um, the events that led up to the uh, 1981 to 1989 uh, trouble. But that, um, and then in, um, 1987, Congress passed the Agricultural Credit Act of 1987. And this is, was also a very critical law to restructure uh, the system and avoid the uh, previous economic uh, uh, circumstances. So what this act did is it strengthened borrower rights. And we'll have, we'll talk about that later on in the uh, program, but that deals with things such as distressed loans restructuring, which is like, um, a state loss mitigation program on steroids. Um, we'll explain that further on. It also created the Farm Credit System Insurance Corporation, which um, may be more familiar to you as uh, uh, comparable to the uh, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Of course, the difference between us and banks is we don't have deposits. Therefore, the FDIC will insure the deposits of those um, um, people that put their money into the bank. Well, here the Farm Credit System Insurance Corporation, it, what it ensures is those investors who put their money in to finance uh, the system, because as we'll explain later on, our money does not come from Congress, it comes from investors. And then they created Farmer Mac, and that is comparable to what you would think of today as like Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. It's a, uh, uh, another government sponsored enterprise for purposes of acquiring agricultural loans and holding them. Um, and, and important to the individual associations, it created something known as the Agricultural Credit Association. So when you deal with, when you deal with uh, any association today, you deal with Horizon, you're typically going to be uh, confronted with the ACA, Horizon uh, Farm Credit ACA, which pursuant to this law functions much like a holding company, somewhat like a parent company for the two subsidiaries, not created by us, created by Congress and the Farm Credit Administration, um, the two subsidiaries, one of which is the Federal Land Credit Association, which in prior iterations, the law was known as a Federal Land Bank Association. It's responsible for long-term real estate uh, secured lending. Then, as I mentioned earlier, the entities created after World War I, the Production Credit Association. We have a Horizon, PC, Horizon Farm Credit PCA as well. 
it's authorized to make um, short-term and intermediate uh, uh, financing uh, th that does not have to be secured by real estate. So, um, slide 30, um, the differing track tax treatment of the uh, FLCA versus the ACA PCA. Um, this is uh, um, something to be aware of, uh, but won't necessarily affect outside attorneys. Because Congress created the different farm credit system entities at different times with different laws, where the laws didn't mesh, we wind up with the FLCA having different tax exemptions than the PCA and the ACA. But the critical difference is relevant only to the Internal Revenue Service because with the FLCA, it is exempt from paying federal income tax. The P PCA and the ACA do have to pay federal income tax, but otherwise they have general um, statewide, uh, or, or they have general exemptions from all state and local income tax. Okay, now this shouldn't be confused with um, exemptions, tax exemptions created by state law. For those farmers in Pennsylvania that also do business in, in New York, uh, New York has a, a pretty healthy mortgage tax um, and there's an exemption from that, but that exemption is created by state law that references agricultural credit associations. And that was a New York law that was enacted well before 1916. So moving on to slide 31. This is a map of the current um, federal or of the current farm credit banks. There are four within the United States. They are not all equal. You'll see in blue, CoBank headquarters out of the Denver area. Um, CoBank has, in essence, superpowers that the, the other banks do not have. It is the only one authorized to finance international agricultural transactions. And frankly, when you see the $1 billion and above promissory notes, typically um, CoBank will have a, a role in those transactions. Then we have um, an agribank headquartered out of Minnesota and Farm Credit Bank of Texas um, headquartered out of uh, Austin. Our bank that covers uh, Pennsylvania is Ag First Farm Credit Bank uh, headquartered out of Columbia, South Carolina. Now, Ag First, it operates a little different than the other banks because it has greater involvement in the lending process and actually uh, has um, a, a piece of the lending process um, mostly that you would see it or would not see because it's it's on the back end. But uh, that makes uh, Ag First uh, different from the other banks because of. Uh, their more direct involvement in the activity of the associations. So then uh, moving on to next slide, after mergers and uh, of the various associations throughout the United States, I think we're about to 69 at the present time. There have been recent mergers, including uh, our merger that created Horizon on July 1 of um, 2022. So this shows the different associations throughout the United States. And you can see there um, Horizons uh, territory with Pennsylvania, Delaware, uh, most of Maryland, um, the Virginia, Shen uh, Shenandoah Valley and lower uh, Delmarva Peninsula, as well as the two West Virginia uh, panhandles. Okay, next slide. Uh, former Mac, started by Congress in 1987 to create that secondary market a market for agricultural, real estate, and rural home mortgages. It purchases loans directly from lenders and it issues long-term standby commitments for eligible loans. It's stockholder, stockholder owned and publicly traded. All right, um, slide 34, farm credit as of December 31, 22. This is for the entire farm credit system nationwide. It's an American success story. Uh, the system holds 41% of all U.S. farm debt. Um, we had 601, 500 plus farm credit customers nationwide. Um, there were $19.1 billion in new loans to small farmers and ranchers. And there was uh, 957 
1,161 loans at the end of the year for a total volume of $373. billion. Uh, next slide. The uh, farm credit systems loan portfolio is divided amongst various uh, agricultural and rural America sectors as is depicted on this slide. Um, and I will leave you to um, review that as your, at your leisure. Um, okay, moving on, next slide. How does this system all work? Um, I'm gonna start on the right-hand slide of this uh, flow chart. So this is global and US investors will uh, give their investment money to the selling groups and bond dealers who will in turn uh, loan that money to the farm credit uh, funding corporation that in turn takes the, and, and it's loaned to them via bond sales, agricultural bond sales. Um, and the proceeds of those bonds are then loaned to the four farm credit system banks that in turn lend that money to the individual re, uh, retail associations like Horizon, who in turn lend it to the borrowers. The borrowers then make their interest payments back to the association, who in turn makes their interest payments back to the farm credit bank, and in turn makes it back to the funding corporation, back to the bond uh, dealers, and ultimately back to the bond investors. And with that, I think Audrey, we have a small slide to, or a video to explain this. Farm Credit supports rural communities and agriculture with reliable, consistent credit and financial services. Our cooperative structure and unique funding model help deliver on that mission to every county in rural America. As a private and locally owned cooperative, Farm Credit borrowers become owners of their local Farm Credit lender when they take out a loan. This gives them the right to elect their peers to represent their interests on the board of directors. Cooperative ownership is especially beneficial to members when the co-op shares its earnings. But where does the money come from to begin with? Farm Credit does not accept deposits and is not funded by the government. Instead, Farm Credit issues bonds in the money markets. The money from the sale of these bonds is used by local Farm Credit organizations to make loans to rural communities and agriculture. As loans get paid back with interest, Farm Credit provides a return to those investors, keeps what it needs to operate, then returns the rest to its customer owner. The cooperative structure and source of funding work together to make Farm Credit a strong and reliable source of credit today and tomorrow. Visit farmcredit.com to learn more. Hey, thank you, Audrey. Uh, our next slide is Farm Credit Administration. Uh, it's our prudential regulator. I think we've uh, sufficiently covered that. Slide 40, Farm Credit Council. It's our National Trade Association that um, who represents the various components of the farm credit system in uh, dealing with Congress and with members of the executive branch. It also provides a mechanism for grassroots involvement in the um, uh, political process. Um, and it also provides services through uh, FCC services to uh, components of the farm credit system, such as audit training and conferences. Farm Credit uh, System Insurance Corporation created uh, via the Agricultural Act of 1987, and it enhances the financial integrity of the entire farm credit system and ensures the payment of principal and interest on the insured notes, bonds, and other obligations issued on behalf of the farm credit uh, uh, banks. And it administers the farm credit insurance fund and collects the annual premiums. And with that, I think Audrey has uh, the next point. All right, for those of you listening for CLE credit, your CLE code word for today is finance. So make sure to put that into your form. Uh, CLE code word is finance, F-I-N-A-N-C-E, -E, finance. And one last time, CLE code is finance. All right, back to you, Doug. Thank you. Okay, uh, part two. So now we're gonna transition into discussing topics in which the outside attorneys typically 
uh, interact with the farm credit system. And I think before we can really talk about those issues on which we interact, I think we first need to understand uh, the farmer, the farm and finance. And so these are my own personal observations um, that uh, I've seen over time. Uh, that I think uh, attorneys in rural America need to be aware of as they are representing farmers. First off, the farm is the principal capital asset of a small business. A farm is not a house with a big yard and it cannot be treated as a consumer residence. A farm also often consists of multiple parcels, some of which are leased. Um, the equipment is often subject to multiple UCC financing liens. And uh, there are other, prim other primary assets include living things that require care and input. So in a bankruptcy situation, uh, there are different cash collateral use considerations because livestock's got to be fed. Um, and there's other interested uh, parties. So for example, in the poultry business, there are integrators. The farmers may be raising uh, the chickens, but the chickens are provided by the um, uh, integrators. Um, and there is a high degree of federal, state, and local regulation. I attended one um, AALA uh, symposium with a class dedicated to this, and it's like, um, it, it, you know, these are small businessmen, the uh, farmers, or the family farmers, and just the volume of federal and state laws of uh, pile on top of them is significant. And again, that's where I encourage uh, rural American <coughs> attorneys to specialize in the, these areas of law. There's a, a great need for that, for those legal services. Okay, understanding farm finance. A farmer is frequently gonna have more than one lender. There's gonna be overlapping collateral. There's gonna be real, uh, including real estate finance, equipment finance, operating loans, crop and processor advances, and farmers borrow annually. Typically, they will have multiple mortgages with cross fault and cross lien provisions encumbering multiple different parcels. And those uh, mortgages and financing agreements will include future advances and revol revolving precision provisions. Um, and then there's also different uh, lien priorities. It's not just the uh, UCC financing statement security interests that have to be concerned with. Every state has um, uh, many agricultural related statutory liens. And then there's uh, interest in um, uh, the farm assets created by a variety of federal laws. And frankly, this is one of the, the most difficult uh, portions of my job. You know, I come from um, 20 plus years at a Home Ownership Loan Act bank, a federal savings bank. And, uh, you know, coming out of that experience, you kind of like expect the spaghetti to come straight out of the box in straight lines and have uniform sauce on it. And when you look at a farm's finance, it more resembles a bowl of spaghetti. Um, so it's, it's a complex arrangement. Um, that is uh, unlike um, other uh, rural residential properties that you will encounter. Okay, interest rate and loan terms. Our interest rates and the cost of credit is all determined by federal law. This is not a matter of state law. State law does not control our late charges, our prepayment premiums or our interest rates. And that's again, because of the US Supremacy Clause. And I've cited in the uh, materials, the uh, two US statutes that um, provide for um, uh, that authority. And again, our interest rates are set by the various components board of directors, but they're also of course controlled by the funding corporation and the bonds sold on uh, Wall Street. So, that's why there's a current difference in what banks can offer in their interest rates, because that's based upon the interest rate they're paying their depositors. We don't have depositors. We're dealing with bond investors. So that's why our interest rates are currently different from those of um, banks. Okay. Um, and our FL, our farm, uh, Federal Land Credit Association, real estate secured liens, 
they must also be first liens pursuant to the regulation I cited there, which transitions into the next slide. First lien and loan limit requirements. And I've given you here the uh, context of the regulation that requires our FLCA loans to be secured by a first lien in the real estate and that no funds shall be advanced that would exceed 85% of the appraised value. And the land must be comprised primarily of agricultural or rural property. Moving on, uh, uh, CA first liens and title insurance. As I mentioned earlier, Ag First uh, Farm Credit Bank um, is our funding bank, our super, uh, to uh, an extent our supervisory bank, and they impose requirements for eliminating exceptions to title, which is on slide 48. They also require endorsements to title insurance, which is found on slide 49. Okay, moving on to the next significant topic, eligibility for loans. Not anybody can borrow from the farm credit system. So we have various categories of uh, eligible borrowers created by federal statute that I've cited in the materials. First of which is bona fide farmers, ranchers, producers, harvesters of aquatic products. And that's, there's two different categories there. There's both full-time and part-time bona fide farmers. Second category is the providers of related services. Um, third category, the owners of rural homes. And I will elaborate on all these later. Fourth is borrowers engaged in processing and marketing, but the key here is they must, those entities must be owned and controlled by farmers. Okay, next slides. Definition of bona fide farmer and rancher and of agricultural land. Um, so giving you the regulation defining what constitutes a bona fide farmer and the regulation defining agricultural land. And what, what agricultural land is, is land devoted to agriculture and the production of crops or other farm products. So that's significant to be aware of because if, you know, if your cr intended crop is solar panels, you're going to, we're going to, that we're going to have issues here with uh, these uh, definitions and eligibility issues. Okay, moving on, loan purpose and objective. Via these regulations, we have to look at the different categories of our borrowers and what the purpose of the loan is. So for bona fide farmers, they're entitled to full credit for whatever their credit needs may be. A part-time farmer, however, and if I didn't say so on the first one, I was speaking of full-time farmers are entitled to full credit. Part-time farmers are entitled to conservative credit, but only for their agricultural enterprises. The farm-related services, um, that and, and there's another slide on that that will explain it, depends upon the percentage of um, their business that's dedicated to agriculture. And then the owners of rural family homes. So let's go on to prohibited finance in slide 53. There is a uh, regulation that expressly prohibits our financing to be used for purposes of removing land from agricultural um, production. And um, so if you're a, a speculator who wants to buy a, a farm field next to a, a city or a town that's expanding and next to like a, uh, a you know, a shopping center, um, you're probably, <laughs> you're not eligible for a loan from us for that speculative purpose. That, type of financing is prohibited. Okay, farm-related businesses. These are individuals or entities providing farm-related services directly related to agricultural production needs of farmers. When more than 50% of that business's income is related to farm-related services, we can finance all business activities. However, if 50% or less if less than 50% is related to farm related services, the system can only finance that portion that pertains to agriculture. Okay, next slide farm related businesses. Examples are custom spraying and fertilizing, tillage and harvesting services, grain drying and storage, not eligible, equipment only sales, 
fertilizer or pesticide only sales or feed mills selling only bulk or bagged feed. How do our underwriters and, uh, conduct an, al an analysis of eligibility? They do it in a four step process, starting with a determination of what is the agricultural or non-agricultural purpose farmer classification, amount of permissible financing, and then an evaluation of the land for permissible or prohibited financing. Okay, next slide. Um, rural home financing. Here I've given you the regulation that um, gives you the detail for rural home financing. First off, this is not available to a bona fide farmer. It must be a single family home that is moderately priced. It must be um, situated in a community of uh, less than 2,500 people. Moderately priced uh, per the regulation means in the 70th, 75th percentile or less of values. Eligibility, you can get one such loan. You can't buy multiple homes uh, with this type of financing. And the purpose of that financing be buying the home, building the home, remodeling, improving, or repairing uh, the home, or refinancing that debt. The rural home financing um, to non-farmers, therefore it's generally subject to the federal consumer lending laws. Those borrowers are not entitled to patronage, and they are not entitled to borrower rights. So, Good transition into our next topic, borrower rights under the Farm Credit Act. Um, so here I've given you the uh, statutes, the several statutes and the several regulations that uh, comprise borrower rights. Generally, and th this is critical for outside attorneys to understand, as well as for the uh, solar lease and develop development community. Generally, these rights may not be waived. And there are provision for an effective interest rate, and a differential interest rate. So if you're accustomed to uh, lending under the Truth in Lending Act, and there's a disclosure of uh, the, the interest rate, this is the credit system version of that required disclosure. Uh, actions on applications for financing are governed by uh, the statutes and regulations cited there. There's a provision for re review of our credit decisions, and there's protection for those borrowers who meet all their loan obligations. If they're fully compliant with their loan obligation, the association may not require additional collateral nor principal reductions. And there's a couple other uh, provisions in that regulation as well. Um, now, the farmer has not consistently been um, paying uh, per the terms of the load note, and he's not yet in default, but he's not in, uh, in non-accrual status, we are obligated at that point in time to notify the farmer that uh, the loan has gone to non-accrual status. Um, and then distress loan restructuring. As I said earlier, this is kind of like the state law loss mitigation on steroids. Um, uh, Bottom line on that, the farmer has a right to propose his own restructuring plan. And um, if that's not successful, uh, if it's not implemented and the property goes to foreclosure, the borrower, the borrower has rights to first refusal. He has a right of first refusal at the foreclosure sale. And if the association takes title and goes to sell a property again, the farmer has the right of first refusal there. And that cannot be assigned to um, the solar developers as they often include in their documentation. Okay, um, next topic. We're not, a, we're not a bank, we're not a credit union. We don't have a depository function. We only disperse loans. We don't have checking accounts. So the reason I'm bringing that up, the issue of subpoenas and document requests. Whatever a subpoena or document you may wish to issue and deliver to a component of the farm credit system is governed by federal law. It is not governed by state law. And like the um, discovery case law uh, pertaining to the uh, other government sponsored enterprises, uh, you'll find that the discovery from a, a government sponsored enterprise is highly restricted by federal law. 
So um, here, uh, the, the um, Congress has enacted 12 U.S.C. 2200 um, uh, pertaining to uh, limited access to our records. And then our the uh, FCA has enacted not one, but three separate subparts of regulations dealing with privacy of our records, privacy of the borrower's records, private and access to those records. And then sub 618 deals specifically with the associations um, and our uh, obligations to protect uh, those records. Um, so the end result of that is if you serve a motion to quash, or I'm sorry, if you serve a subpoena on me, the first thing you're gonna get is an email from me asking you to withdraw the subpoena because we have a mandatory obligation to file a motion to quash or for a protective order. And you also need to be aware our borrowers have limited access to records. Pursuant to the statute and regulation, there's only four categories of documents to which they may gain access. The loan documents delivered at closing, the documents signed by the borrower, the appraisals, and copy of the association's charter and bylaw. Okay, moving on to the next topic. And these are observations. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm not telling you how to uh, practice uh, law. I'm just telling you about what I observe uh, as difficulties that our farmers in, encounter. And on this slide, we're gonna talk about business entities. I do see farmers coming to us with excessively complex business entity structures that will include trust corporations, LLCs, general partnerships, limited partnerships, limited liability partnerships. And frankly, I understand the, the risk management concept behind it, but there's too much. It's too much for the, for the farmer to implement, routinely document and manage. And it often results in things like commingling of cash and accounts and no documentation uh, for transactions. Um, you know, I often get questions like, well, why can't um, we uh, pay the uh, uh, mortgage loan that the trust owes out of the LLC account? Um, and, and that's that's an indicator that so to me that the business entity uh, uh, arrangement was too complex to, to manage. The other problem we have, not so much in Pennsylvania, but in our other four states, is the do-it-yourself LLCs. Um, the other four states within our territory have all uh, created a quote business friendly uh, website to create an LLC. So you fill in four blanks and you're done and they've excused the requirement for an operating agreement. Um, so the result is a thinly uh, documented LLC um, in, um, and, and frankly, that then you, it leads to questions of uh, alter ego doctrine. Uh, have they um, um, abided by the corporate formalities? Um, so then the other thing that we often see is complex estate planning and tax trusts. Uh, some creating multiple trusts for ownership of an operating small business that farmers oftentimes find difficult to operate the, uh, their farming business when, when it's owned by a trust. I also see cookie cutter standard form trusts in, in specific areas where you can see the uh, every farmer's getting the same uh, standard form uh, trust agreement. Um, so what I would ask of you attorneys is to please discuss business documentation and management duties, the ongoing documentation and management duties with farmers before these uh, complex business entities are, are created. Okay, next slide. Observations, difficulties frequently encountered. Um, uh, I think we're on, um, okay, the real property. Again, farmers borrow annually and they typically have mortgage, multiple mortgages and multiple different parcels of farmland with cross default and cross lien provisions and sometime cross lien across state lines. Um, and, there, and I just ask that, uh, that those complex financing arrangements be considered when drafting real estate's interestments, instruments and when putting uh, farms into revocable trusts. Um, and I've also noticed um, that uh, farmers have started shedding and getting rid of 
their estate and tax plans that are uh, based upon trusts and converting to plans based upon LLCs. I'm not an estate and uh, tax lawyer. I cannot give you any advice on that, but I do attend the agricultural law <laughs> symposiums where uh, university professors who are experts in agricultural tax have explained to me why this is, is happening. But um, please consider those things. Um, get yourself very well educated in those issues um, uh, before uh, drafting um, uh, real property documents. Troubled estate plan. Uh, typically farmers will have one, maybe two children who will engage in farming. Uh, and also farmers often do not want the farm cut up. And you can think of um, Kevin uh, Costner's character in Yellowstone. They want that farm preserved beyond their lifetimes. And when the farm uh, parcels are divided among several uh, children, but only one uh, of those children farm, that often results in either a termination of farming altogether because it's not economically feasible, perhaps a subdivision of the farm, um, or the one uh, child who is farming um, it has an overwhelming debt to buy out uh, the siblings. And then the other ugly side of that is sometimes you'll see the family feud litigation over that. So what I would ask is that you please discuss those topics with farmers before developing their estate plan. And amongst the resources, I reference a um, um, Virginia CLE program uh, offered in 2022 that um, uh, covered this and was presented by a, um, a state and trust attorney who was very well versed in um, uh, providing agricultural estate and tax plans. So I would say, don't listen to me on that. Please go listen to people with greater expertise. Okay, last slide, uh, the observations, large scale solar leases and conservation easements. These give us difficulty because they interfere with eligibility and impair present and future financing under the uh, laws that govern our uh, financing and may result in requirements to either pay down the loan or to pay off the loan. Um, that portion of the farm that, which oftentimes cannot be legally subdivided because of uh, other obligations like the tax exemption law obligations. Um, it's that portion of the farm out of the category of agricultural land and that then imp has impact on like our loan limits and uh, future financing. And then when the solar project is financed on Wall Street and they have, uh, um, you know, uh, several hundred million dollar financing over multiple farms, and that's recorded in, in the land records. I understand it's intended to be only recorded as a fixture filing, but it does create issues that need to be dealt with, uh, preferably by the farmer's attorney um, being aware of these issues and dealing with it in the terms of the solar lease. Um, okay. Uh, and the, the solar lease and developers uh, need to understand that um, the borrower rights exist, cannot be waived, and they cannot take a right of first refusal. Conservation easements to the extent they uh, restrict agricultural activities can also um, cause some difficulty. And then I think we're at the uh, last slide on- uh, We are. Thank you resources. so much, Douglas.